<laughs> so we talked about intersectionality, and I'm going to come right to Gina A. Brown because um, whether or not HIV is present in terms of age, in terms of exposure, in terms of knowledge, HPV is still happening and it's still devastating young girls, adolescents, and young women, and then later in life, um, women in and beyond their years of childbearing. So Gina, the reason we met you was not, okay, yeah, for me, it was because you were Gina and Brown. But there are other Gina's Brown. You, when we had that first conversation, really struck and inspired me because HIV wasn't necessarily on your radar of the work you do, but HPV is. And it immediately struck me how common and how similar our work is. So in a few minutes, can you talk about one, your experience, your story, how, how did you get through that? What did you learn? What did you learn? But also, after learning how this thing intersects with HIV, how that has helped you do your work around HPV. My... <laughs> My first experience came from an abnormal pap smear an abnormal pap smear that proved to have cancerous cells, which caused me to have a full hysterectomy. Never went through the um, radiation or any of those stages because it was caught early just by an abnormal pap smear, by having a regular annual pap smear done. And so I never went through any of the phases that most people who have cancer or cancer cells go through. And it helped me a lot to realize that <clears throat> knowing your body's normal is the most important thing you can do. And, and what I mean by that is stay off of WebMD and Google and go to the doctor and get yourself checked because you know if you've had something an abnormal bump or rash or something on your body, you know it hadn't been there. So the natural thing for us as women and as mothers, most of us, is to try to cure it ourselves. But my doctor was very adamant about the only thing that saved me from having a severe case was because of the early detection. So. I figured that um, based on what I do career-wise, I've been uh, a radio jack for over 25 years and I'm also a local entertainer. I've been singing as long as I've been talking is what they say, but um, professionally for over 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for over 25 years. So I use my platform to educate women about early detection. I created a campaign called Ask Me About Ed. And so most people would say, well, who's Ed? <laughs> but Ed is early detection. That means you need to go and get yourself checked. I currently work for, well, not work for, I'm a volunteer at WHIV FM New Orleans, which is 102.3 on your radio dial. So if you're ever in New Orleans, make sure you put it on now. And I have, um, I have a show called G's Corner, and I help to, one, spread the word about early detection and about going, getting yourself checked and knowing your body's normal. And I partner with a lot of other support groups in the city, Coffee, which is a circle Friends for Early Detection, um, the Susan G. Coleman Gorman, and as well as a lot of other cancer um, associations in this particular area. But I also dedicate my show to local artists because as an artist, I worked commercial radio for several years, and when I became a recording artist, 
I couldn't get my music played on the radio. <laughs> so this was an opportunity for me to actually give other local artists in the city an opportunity to showcase themselves. But I will say that um, it's been a ministry in such an amazing way. Because my mother was a, a gospel recording artist, my grandmother, and so I come from a family of singers and musicians. And part of my ministry is being able to share the gift that God gave me. And so I do it willingly and openly with all the artists that I know by telling them about the resources that's available to us to go and have mammograms and circle screenings. And we have the Musicians Clinic in New Orleans right now that still, you know, is fighting to get them to be a member of, but <clears throat> it's there. And so I share the resources, so I consider myself a, a dot connector. <laughs> but my very first meeting of, with the three genas, I was inducted to the Positive Women's Network. And so my song became, With every little bit of thing I do, I'm gonna do my best for you. Oh, oh Lord, I'm committed. I'm gonna do my all in all, no matter what the call. Oh, oh Lord, yes, I'm committed. So that's my song. That's my show. And I am Judy Brown. That's me about HIV and HPV. Thank you, Gina. Thank you so very much. You brought a whole you. another edge to intersectionality that I hadn't even connected. So thank you. Gina. Marie Brown. Woo! So, it ain't no secret. Believe me, HIV. Because I, I, I saw you send out an invite to your birthday party, so it ain't no secret. <laughs> that you got a silver, a silver, what do you call it? Seroversary. Have y'all heard of that? A seroversary. That's the anniversary of your zero status. And so you are coming up on your 25th seroversary. And your road has been long. What I'm curious about and what you've experienced and learned at this intersection is a, because most black women y'all know, young and then, because I'm a then. <laughs> 26 and 29, I don't know, I can't do the math. Double the youth the youth are. But, <laughs> Pregnancy is when most people find out about their HIV status. Or for others, it's when they decide to seek treatment because of substance or alcohol um, challenges and abuses. And then there are all these other concomitant, you know, comorbidities that you didn't start to find that you didn't know because you're now in the health system. So I think you have a different understanding of where this HIV and HPV thing comes together because I've heard you talk about pregnancy, being pregnant, but also dealing with the substance issues. Tell me how you connect those things and looking at those other comorbidities that impact your fertility, that impact your birth um, experiences, and how that plays out in the work that you do as an HIV activist and advocate. Well, wait, before you do that, I need to say how I'm connected to this Gina Brown. I worked at FM 98 and I was on the air and I said, you listen to WYLD, FM 98, and she called me and she said, is your real name Gina Brown? And I said, yes it is, biological. She said, we need to meet, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, the other two. Wait, 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 I gotta 
got another one for you. <laughs> so I knew Dr. Gina Brown, and I knew, and this is how I distinguish other than the A's, I knew my girl, Gina Brown. And when I talked to Dr. Gina Brown one time, I said, because um, she didn't know. Gina, you can co-sign for me if you feel like it, Doc. I said, you do know that there's another Gina Brown doing this HIV work, right? She said, no. Yeah. And then she said, wait a minute, I think I might. I said, yeah, you got me. And that's my job. I, my purpose in life is to create the space people need to do what they need to do. And the second part to that is to put the people in that space to get it done. So I said, y'all need to be for real. Though. And Gina said, this one. She said, you know what? Now that I think about it, I think I canceled that poor child from one time. And then what happened? We had a conference, the U.S. Conference on AIDS, and Gina found out mistaken you had to check out and leave early. And when you were checking out of your room, the hotel said, but ma'am, you have two rooms. And you said, what? I don't have two rooms. So you shut, you just canceled both of them. And then if I remember, because I was there, I was there when you showed up in the lobby with no room. Gina Brown, my girl, comes in to the same conference, same day after this one has left, and ain't got no room. So three or four years later, when I put them in the same room, this one says, yes, hi, it's a pleasure to meet you, and I think I canceled a room for you one time. That one says, Oh, that's what happened to my room? Do you know what that is? It was hilarious. <laughs> so there is a connection between all those genes, and it's not just their name. Gene, you can get to the question now. Okay. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really nervous, y'all. I always get nervous. I don't know why. But um, as Dizan said, I am a woman that with HIV 24 years. I'll be celebrating 25 years next year. And I say I will because I'm going to be here. Um, yeah. I'm a woman also who has a substance abuse background. Um, I've been clean and sober. Next month will be 26 years for that. And in my, in my drugging, I didn't have a job. As a matter of fact, I quit my job to get high because I needed to get high every day all day. But I quit my job and my job became um, either hustling on the streets, selling drugs, or selling my body. Um, being really naive about HIV, I thought that if I just stayed in my little small community and only had sex with people, because none of us had, had cars, and I don't know why I didn't think we could get on the bus and go somewhere, but I figured like, if nobody had cars, and nobody was really going out there doing anything, we were just doing it with each other. Um, in 1994, I was pregnant with my daughter when I was given my diagnosis. As I said in the movie, I was told that, uh, that I had AIDS and I was going to die. It was the most devastating thing that anybody could have told me. But something happened magical that day. A nurse came down, and I'm telling you, I was sitting in a chair like this. And when she walked in, we were the same height with me sitting down. <laughs> and she was the sweetest person I ever met in my life. And she told me if I did three things, I could live. And because this other nurse had just told me I was gonna die, when she said live, I kind of sat up. And if I would have been a dog, my ears would have stood up because I was listening. And she said, attend every doctor's appointment. Whatever medication they put you on, take it exactly as prescribed and learn everything you can about this virus. I can do that. Never knowing that, that those were things that were going to get me from point A to B to C to D to where I'm at today. In 24 years of living with this virus, and I tell the story, people look at me like, what? In 24 years, I've missed my mask three times. Everybody. <laughs> the first time was when I evacuated from Hurricane Katrina. I'm from New Orleans. And it was a 16 hour ride to the office of Texas. And when I got there, I was so tired, I was like, forget the medicine, forget everything. I got in bed and went to sleep. The second time I went to um, Texas on a trip, an overnight trip, to speak at a university, and I forgot to pack. And the third time I was having a colonoscopy, and the doctor said, don't take anything. And I didn't know that I could take my medicine, so I didn't take it. Then when I told him, he was like, oh, you could have taken your medicine. 
your best. <laughs> I was like, oh, I didn't know. So in 24 years, it's been three times because I bought into everything she said. My, my journey to HIV started at five when I was starting to be molested. And as I said in the movie, I never, I, first of all, nobody ever got me any counseling. And I was introduced to sex in such a bad way that I didn't even know what healthy sex was. You know, um, and I felt like with, with, with sex, I had power. So I could use my sex as my power. And I could decide that I wanted to give it to everybody or nobody. And I decided I was gonna give it to everybody. I had some very friendly vagina. I did. Now, after I got clean and sober, right before I got my diagnosis, I made up my mind that I wanted to change my life. I come from um, a family where nobody had ambition. It wasn't about going to college. It was like, oh, I'm going to drop out of school, okay? Oh, I'm going to get a job at McDonald's, okay? It was never about doing the next thing or, or elevating, you know, bringing yourself up. Um, at that time, I said, you know, I want to do something different. I don't want to be like everybody in my neighborhood and in my family. But then I got my diagnosis and I went into depression. Still was going to the doctor, take my medication, doing everything I needed to do. And I just kind of fell off for a while. But the one thing I did, and I shared this, ICW, I found out about ICW, and I signed up. And I would get emails from them, and I would print them out, because I didn't want to leave them on my computer afraid that somebody would see it. And at night, I would read this information under the cover with a flashlight. Because <laughs> I didn't want anybody to see me reading it. I was really, you know, like, I didn't want anybody to know. I'll be quick with this part. Um, when my daughter was seven, she asked me, she said, why do you take all that medicine and don't lie? And I disclosed my status to her. There was a book at the time called A Mrs. Stewart, My Grandma Has AIDS. And we read it together and I disclosed to her. And I didn't tell her that it was a secret because see, when I was getting molested, I was told it was a secret. And to me, secrets imply something bad. I told her it was private. This was private. We can talk about it at home, but we're not talking about it with other people. Um, and then I said, how can I sit on this information and not share it? How can I, I've always been in a rubble. I've always been one. My first action was in seventh grade. I convinced my whole school that they fed us grass, that the coleslaw was made out of grass and everybody walked out with me. I don't even know why they listened to me, but they did. <laughs> so I've always had this, this fight in me. And I was, I was tired of hiding my status. So I went public. I went on the news and um, disclosed my status. That's another thing. I don't like telling people stuff one by one. I'd rather tell a whole room of people than to tell you one by one. Then I felt bad for this one because I said my name before they showed my face. And I was like, oh my goodness, they're going to think it's her. They're going to think it's her. So I felt so bad about that. But I knew it was something that I had to do. I knew that I had to show my face and show people that this is what HIV looks like. And the only way you know you can have it is to get tested. So I hope I answered the question. So, like I said, I was keenly aware, and, and she, I'm going to say it, because you know I tell people all the time, Dorothy, that I am a period mental puzzle, which is the real thing. Um, it's defined as a condition of short-term memory loss and or lapse uh, of about 45 to 90 especially on the continent, uh, dealing with HIV and all of the different comorbidities and the social determinants and the intersections that really are um, just zoned in, or as my sister Prudence would say, wired in on our young uh, women and girls. But we don't spend enough time also dealing with women who are aging in HIV and all of these other issues. And you clearly disclosed today your own story, and you're not in the U.S., and you are hashtag I am Gina Brown. So you are here. And the story that, I, the, or the question that I have for you is, as a woman from Eastern Africa, dealing with all of the things that have to be dealt with around the stigmas of HIV, 
you also openly talk about your bout, your fight, your struggle with cervical cancer. And so the question I have is what was different about those two things and what was just the same. Thank you. Um, I'm not Gina. <laughs> <laughs> Probably that would be a pet name. I'm Dorothy Anyango. Um, I'm a mother. I'm a grandmother. And um, I have been HIV positive for now 28 years. I think I was in Amsterdam 26 years ago during the 1992 AIDS conference and um, I think this is where we founded ICW and I think that, just, that was my first encouragement because I met all these women who are HIV positive, 54 beautiful women because I had expected I would come and meet skeletons, you know, what I used to see on the billboards at, at home. So I think that is what gave me courage. So I was diagnosed in 1990, and uh, of course that time there was no treatment. And then now to crown it all again, before I even got medication, I was, you know, I, I think I used to get itchiness in my private part. And, you know, every time I go, I was given antibiotics and, you know, it cleared that particular time and then when it goes off, then it starts again. So I think once I walked into the hospital and um, the doctor said that I need to do um, pap smear. That was around 1996. I have not started medication for years, means it's not affordable, it's not even there. Then here you are, another death sentence you have abnormal sites. I, I didn't know what to do. Um, I think my only consolation was the support groups that we had. As WOFAC, we used to conduct support groups. WOFAC is Women Fighting AIDS in Kenya, which I also founded after the ICW meeting in, in, um, in Amsterdam. So, um, it was easy for me to talk about the abnormal cell because I had not disclosed my HIV status to my family, to everybody, so it was only within the support groups. And so I think they did, um, they had, in, in Kenya we have something called Harambe, your friends sit together and, uh, and they um, collect money, so I was actually taken to, to London for treatment. Of course, not everybody could do that. So, you know, when I came back, I was wondering how many other women are suffering and cannot go to London like Dorothy. So, I, I think I just encouraged women because this was my first time. I had never done a pap smear. And so I had to encourage other women to actually ensure that they do pap smear whenever they could. But this was within the support, support group. So, really, um, for us in, 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 in Kenya, in Africa, and especially in, Ken, in Kenya, it, it was not very easy. But I think with the solidarity that we have together with women, uh, women living in HIV, I think we become one family. And then you go over the borders, another family. You go to the international conference, a bigger family. So really this is what helps us. But of course we need more support than just that because there are women suffering out there, they don't know where to go. We need to create this information to them. It needs to reach the community, down the, the very local woman in the community, so that actually we can be able to curb these diseases before you know, they blow up to, you know, to be cancerous. So for me, it was difficult, but um, it was my responsibility to share with other women to make sure that, um, that uh, they don't get to that. Uh, state and you know I feel really happy you know like when I meet people in the streets say you know um, you know I came through Wofak you did this to me I can't remember because there's so many of them you know people calling me mom people call me 
grandmother, and you know, my happiness is that they're actually surviving and there is something that is being done to them. And really, I must say that the donor support, the donor support has been great. Um, UNAIDS, I walk into their office anytime in, 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 in Nairobi, from the very beginning, not just now, and the, the support is tremendous. Sometimes it's not money, it's technical support. I think our first, our first computer came from UNAIDS in Nairobi office, and, and the desk. So I think we must applaud the donors, they have supported us, and um, I think we are here because of the support that we get, and from all of you friends and, you know, sisters sitting here. So thank you very much for the opportunity. As I said, I'm now a grandmother uh, of two, and uh, my son is going to wait on the 4th of August. You're all invited. <laughs> thank you, Dorothy. I am also a teacher. <laughs> so, um, Doc and Gina and Gina and Gina next. Um, typically, we would have a bigger conversation, but we already had a big conversation. So I want to really thank Dr. Brown, who has given us time when she can't see us and we can't see her. So let us give her a call. Round of because I am going to knock on all kinds of wood, or as my mother would do, and because she called me a hard head, um, is all three genes are going to be in the same space because this thing is a road show as far as I'm concerned. That if you are not talking about HIV and HPV and young and used to be young and still can remember young, in your communities, we got some genas that can tell you some stories and can bring stories from within your communities. And we're gonna do that. At this moment, so I wanna say thank you to all our genas. Please give them a round of applause. Woo! There 